welcome to this week's Dividend Cafe podcast. I uh, am kind of excited for for this week's edition, and I'll tell you why. Um, much like the first time I got to record back in the studio here in our Newport Beach office after the quarantine lockdown, all that, and that was sort of a special occasion just because it represented some resumption of normalcy. Um, there also, though, today is a little bit of a resumption of normalcy in the fact that I'm actually recording on Thursday afternoon, which we recorded the Dividend Cafe podcast, or, or for those of you watching on video, the, the video on Thursdays for most of the last five years, I think. And we switched to Fridays in the midst of the market chaos um, because it was not just possible, but because it, it's always possible, but it was be, it was becoming incredibly likely that the information was becoming outdated like an hour after recording, let alone a whole day after recording. And let me be clear, that is entirely possible again right now. It's very possible you're listening to this on Friday afternoon, and I've recorded Thursday afternoon. And some great market event um, has transpired that is already kind of, you know, may, you, you're wondering why I'm not talking about what something that happened in the market today or on Friday. Um, and, the, and the reason I'm not is because it's not Friday yet for me, okay? Uh, so I have to record with that risk. But I also am doing it because I am preparing to go back to New York. And that is what I think is uh, most exciting, just in the sense that my uh, family and I left New York on March 13th, which was a Friday. I'd been in New York that week. Um, most of you know I go back and forth between California and New York, two offices, two homes, you know, kind of a bi-coastal reality. I've done it for three and a half years now. And um, that week, I'd been in New York all week, uh, a lot of meetings, um, but then, you know, just to kind of break down throughout the week of what was happening, not only in markets, it was a, an awful week in markets, um, but it was uh, also a week in which things were really starting to escalate as far as the spread of the coronavirus. And it was the week following that New York ended up going to lockdown. And, of course, California went to lockdown as well. So on that Friday night, um, I was going to be flying home a couple of days later anyways. But on that Friday night, my wife and I and our two kids flew back to California. And then, of course, the next week, the lockdown transpired. Markets uh, bottomed out that following week or two. And then, you know, March and April became those months for the history books and really pretty much through through most of May as well, although we got to start to kind of open back up again near the end of May. So I'm not repeating or rehashing anything you don't already know, but um, to be able to get back to New York now as they have kind of begun their reopening, um, our office in New York will do its official reopening on July the 6th. Um, but just to kind of get back into the city and, and uh, deal with things that we need to deal with there, I'm excited to see some clients. I'm excited to see my uh, East Coast-based team members and uh, excited to just have that additional layer of normalcy and, of course, incredibly grateful um, for this improved dynamic that uh, is has taken place in, in New York and the tri-state area at large where really ground zero of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic existed in the United States, uh, an incredibly disproportionate number of mortalities and, um, and infections taking place in, the, in that area of the country. And to see the collapsing of their uh, death rate um, is a blessing uh, because that, it was a very frightening time for a while there. Now, this week in the Dividend Cafe, there there are a number of things that you're going to see me address in the written commentary, bigger picture things, not <clears throat> not all current events, you know, more, more uh, I think, macro type issues that, that I want to be able to go through. Uh, but I guess I should start off with just a little bit of a summary about the week in markets and just take my chances on the fact that Friday... Uh, has you know is TBD, um, 
This week, we saw markets drop 700 points on Wednesday, and then we saw markets uh, uh, drop 200 points more Thursday morning, but then rally 500 points to finish up 300 on Thursday. So I'm well aware of the fact that intraday volatility is alive and well. It's less than it was in that March-April mode, but that, well, particularly the March mode, but that, that level of intraday volatility was just insane. And now we're at elevated but not insane levels of volatility. In other words, it's above average, but I, I don't think I could with a straight face call it uh, crazy just because crazy took on a different definition during the, the peak COVID month. Um, look, my one of my theories in, in Dividend Cafe this week is that a good portion of the market volatility, in particular downward pressure in market prices, may not be as obvious as people think regarding the case escalation of coronavirus in um, Florida and Arizona and Texas. Uh, I, I really do believe that there is a kind of tug of war right now that – the market is debating how willing it is to just sort of coexist with the reality of um, coronavirus, particularly as it appears to be a less fatal and a less severe uh, form of it. That's not necessarily to say, by the way, although some scientists have most certainly said so, I don't know enough to be able to say that it's the, the virus itself mutating into a less severe form of itself. What I do know is that the infections are disproportionately right now um, striking a younger and healthier part of the population, which is leading to a significantly different statistical reality in hospitalizations and intubations and ventilations and hospital stays. I also do believe, you can say this is me being optimistic, but I think I have a lot of empirical support for this position, that the medication and some of the treatment is much different right now than it was in in March. Um, some of the FDA accelerated emergency provisions, remdesivir being one that continues to come up in reports I'm reading from hospitals in southeast Texas, in Maricopa County, Arizona, um, in South Florida. There, there seems to be a growing uh, belief that they just have a better handle on the treatment. Now, we're still going to see for mortalities, okay? This is this is a deadly virus when it is matched with a vulnerable uh, situation, particularly a comorbidity. Now, here's the thing regarding the markets and the response to it. Um, I think that you saw Joe Biden up 14 points in a national poll this week that is considered extremely credible. And I know it's called the New York Times Siena poll, and a lot of people would say, oh, well, the New York Times isn't trustworthy. But they don't commission the poll. Um, this is a poll that historically has done very, very well. They are kind of a sponsor. But the Siena poll um, was quite spot on in 2016 and across some of the individual state data as well. And even if you like this poll or don't like that poll or what have you, the blended average of polls show a very significant widening of a lead for Joe Biden over President Trump. Um, and particularly in some of the battleground states that are very likely to be considered the place in which the next president will, will win or lose. When you look at the Wisconsin's and Michigan's and Pennsylvania's, Arizona is now considered a battleground, North Carolina, Florida. And every single one of those states, Biden having a, a significant lead with over President Trump, significant or or, you know, uh, maybe less so in some states, but but enough that it's outside the margin of error in this poll. Um, I think that markets are looking at the overall political predicament and saying, OK, we have an economy that still has to rebound. There's a lot of optimism. It's going to rebound. I have a lot of optimism It's going to rebound, but we know it's going to be shaky. There's some vulnerability around it. We're not totally sure what the impact of corporate earnings will be going into Q3, Q4. You have uh, an added uncertainty of the election and the possibility of will something be changing in corporate tax? Um, you know, will something be changing in trade? 
Will, what, what are the, the factors that will drive market positioning into the second half of the year? And I don't believe that we know who's going to win the election right now. And I don't believe the market thinks so either. Uh, believe me, the market would price things differently because then it isn't just about, oh, the market likes this candidate. It goes up. The market doesn't like this candidate. It goes down. What I mean is in the nuances of the market, the particulars as to where they expect policy um, ramifications into given sectors, given companies, the market will, would do that if it had high conviction and was in that kind of um, pricing in discounting process that, that it will inevitably do, whether it's the day after the election or in the weeks before the election, we'll see. You know, we've had elections in our country that the outcome was not in doubt um, going into the election. People knew who was going to win or lose way in advance. We also um, have had elections where the market really didn't know, really couldn't price it in ahead of time. Uh, I think back to like a 2012 where I suppose the market knew better than David Bonson did that Barack Obama was going to beat Mitt Romney for re-election. Um, but the market did not know what exactly would happen with, say, some of the Senate races, for example. Um, and I think that in 2020, you could get to a point where there's some better clarity as to what's going to happen in the presidential race. We'll see. Um, by the way, the, the market can't have total clarity in the presidential race, even if it's just absolutely unanimous, absolutely incontrovertible that there's some lead that Biden has over Trump. And because the market still has to look to the 2016 factor of just surprise. And even and even though I have always maintained that the polls were not that wrong in 2016, they had Hillary Clinton winning by two or three points. She won the popular vote by two or three points. It was just that on the margin, um, the polls were wrong in Pennsylvania, Florida, but it was very much within the margin of error. Um, and it kind of, you know, tilt, it was enough to tilt the Electoral College. And so, the, you know, unless it's a really, really severe gap um, in October, I think that you could very well still have a too close to call issue for the markets. Um, but, but back to my point, the Senate is going to be a bigger issue. And right now you do see widening Senate leads for uh, the Democrat in a couple of states that they're either challenging or protecting. And so as Colorado and Arizona and, um, well, even Montana and Maine, there, there's a number of seats that, that are going to kind of dictate the prospects for the Senate. So I wonder if this week you're not I'm not saying the COVID-19 issues are not a part of it. They most certainly are. But they're a part of a potpourri that includes a handful of things, all of which cannot be classified as good or bad, all of which have to be classified as uncertain and uncertain is worse than bad. And it's something I've talked about a lot over the years. So you have uncertainty in where the election side's going, leaning towards what the market may consider to be bad as far as corporate taxes and deregulation and things like that are concerned. Um, and then, of course, uncertainty, you know, regarding uh, the obvious set of circumstances. Um, economically, airline travels continue to pick up. Restaurant uh, growth is definitely picking up, although the rate of growth has slowed a little. Uh, the mortgage and housing market looks looks pretty darn healthy. Unemployment picture is kind of a mixed bag. I mean, I think that that we expected initial jobless claims were going to drop more this week than they did. They dropped versus the week prior, but not by much, and they're still at a much elevated level. Um, I do. I am sympathetic, by the way, to the argument that some of the reason you're still getting over a million jobless claims a week, initial jobless claims is that there's a backlog getting reported through from some states that had just a tremendous uh, screw-up in getting pro claims processed. I know this um, from, from various research sources, that there's some validity to it. But either way, even adjusted for that, the number's just too high. Although it was good to see the continuous job claims drop by 700,000 people on Thursday today. Um, so I guess there's a mixed bag there, but I would argue that you really can't think of a category right now where there's inc incontrovertibly clear good news or incontrovertibly clear bad news. 
There's leanings that might be negative for markets. Let's call it the politics. There's leanings that might be positive for markets. Let's call it some of the economic data, the recovery. Um, But all of it is still clouded with a certain degree of uncertainty. So that um, has to be factored into the way we view things. Now, what is not uncertain as far as uh, short-term pricing of markets is the Fed's support to risk assets, to capital markets, to liquidity, to credit. Um, I I don't know that I'd call that a certainly good thing long term. I think it does provoke further financialization of the U.S. economy and represents um, a hindrance to productive growth into the future, uh, particularly because I don't expect them to take away that monetary punch bowl anytime soon. But um, in the short term, one of the great reasons that it is very difficult to give in to one's bearishness or skittishness or uncertainty is because of the fact that the Fed is there and alive and well, and um, it's it's not a small thing. Trillions of dollars of support that do have the, the effect of bidding up risk assets. So we continue to be very respectful of market volatility. Um, I go through a whole lot of subjects this week at DividendCafe.com, talk about why um, about the lost decade of gold. Those who worry about central bank abuses have not necessarily found their antidote near, near gold, which is still down now coming up on 10 years later, getting close to the price it was 10 years ago. So I try to um, very gently and humbly put down some of the common misnomers about the, the um, concept of gold as an investment defense. I also um, want to unpack further our belief in illiquidity as a weapon against other investors, the behavioral biases that other investors have that can affect our own public market investing. Uh, the herd mentality when there's a lot of panic investing in stocks, bonds, all sorts of different things, mutual funds that that force prices down. Um, the benefit uh, around being protected from that when people can't do that. They can't affect your pricing by their behavior when they can't themselves are illiquid in their ability to transact in otherwise good um fundamentally solid investments. So the private uh, side in markets of credit, of equity, of real estate, and what those things represent relative to public market counterparts. Um, Again, our clients need liquidity too. So we can't use illiquidity as a catch-all, but where liquidity has been addressed and other aspects of a core portfolio where we have the luxury of implementing illiquidity, we think it provides defense and offense, and and uh, that's something that we're, we're very aggressive about right now. So that's our take on this week in the markets. I will be recording next week's Dividend Cafe going into the 4th of July weekend from the great state of New York. Um, I look forward to getting caught up uh, with my East Coast business over the next several weeks out there. I'll be back in the California office in August. Um, but in the meantime, uh, please reach out to anyone at the Bonson Group with any questions you may have. Uh, we hope your life is returning to some degree of normal. Um, there's still work to do, you know, both in that sort of glide path to normalcy, but also plenty of work to do in markets and in the economy and in our country at large. So please have yourself a wonderful weekend, and we look forward to welcoming the second half of 2020. It's hard to believe we're we're just now getting halfway done. This is a year that just, uh, does I don't know, seems to be taking forever. I'm sure uh, a lot of you feel the same. But thank you for listening to this week's Dividend Cafe.